Welcome everybody to this uh, uh, NH webinar, DigiTalk, Online Geoscience Communication. Uh, this seminar has been organized by the Natural Hazard Early Career Scientist Team of EGU. Uh, very briefly, I'm going to, to, to introduce our, our group. Uh, the Natural Hazard Early Career Scientist Team is a, is a very active team inside the European Geophysical Union. Uh, we do a lot of uh, um, interesting activities together. Some of them have been reported here in this slide. We organize sessions, uh, short courses and activities during the General Assembly. We uh, have a very uh, interesting blog that I think that also one of our speakers is going to introduce you uh, today. We meet on our Slack uh, platform to do some networking, to share job opportunities, to discuss uh, together about uh, potential collaboration, to share our knowledge in uh, our personal knowledge regarding natural hazard. And uh, last but not least, we organize uh, a lot of interesting outreach activities such as this uh, webinar that we are organizing today. Of course, if you are interested in joining us, we are really happy to welcome everyone interested in this uh, field and to join us you have just to send an email to this address that is ecs minus nh at egu.eu uh, so let's start with this seminar i'm really happy to have here three special guests today uh, we have julia roder iris van zels and roberto guardo for any question, please use the Q&A chat, dedicated chat. We are going to collect all your questions. And then at the end of the presentations, we have a very, uh, say, um, say, we will have a, a dedicated session in which the different speakers can uh, reply to all your questions. So I leave the fl floor to the first speaker today, that is Giulia Roder. Giulia is a postdoc at the University of Udine in Italy where she studies the economic and non-economic value of water. Uh, in the past, she joined the Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability at the UN University in Tokyo, Japan, working on water sustainability and policies. She has a PhD from the University of Padova, making a thesis on floods and human interactions. Uh, she joined uh, our group, the EG Early Career Scientist Group of DNH Division in 2017, so almost at its beginning. Uh, since then, she has been contributing a lot to the blog and to the, uh, all the activities of the, the group, including the organization of, organization, sorry, of these outreach activities. So I'm really happy to leave the floor to Julia for the first uh, presentation, talks about natural hazards, the EGU blog. Thank you very much, Silvia. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I'm really glad to kick off this webinar regarding geoscience communication. First of all, I really would like uh, to start speaking about our Natural Hazard Division blog that has been launched on December 2017. And up to now, it comes, counts six people that are posting every two weeks almost on a rotational basis plus some guest authors uh, that are publishing once in a year or once in their academic life. We are approaching a broad geoscience community with different type of posts. So we have selected so far interviews, posts, posts about natural hazards event. So just concentrating on single events and this description of them in a more uh, scientific, but also in a broader uh, and informal way. We have started a natural hazard 101 series. So uh, our aim was to give some um, basic definitions of the most important concepts and avoid the misinterpretation on the use of these terminologies. We liked to share our life in academia, but also its struggles and some tips for success. So one month ago, for example, we published a post regarding how to write a scientific paper. One of the most important part also on blogging is the advertisement. In fact, we use Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And as we are a group hosted by EGU, we are retweeted and reshared by the Natural Hazard Division, the EGU, but also on our personal accounts. So let's see how you can start blogging uh, by your own. 
Um, of course, first you have to understand which is the motivation behind your desire to blog. So you have to understand whether you want to share your own research or research topic in a broader sense, whether you prefer to network and make yourself more visible or to communicate geoscience because you are in love with science uh, overall. So you wanted to share it broadly. So there are different types of uh, posts you can offer. Again, you can select to uh, offer your own research, but of course, be aware that can be limited. Um, you can share an interested publication, an interview of someone you would like to network with or someone working on a hot topic. For example, in our blog, we have interviewed a group that has been arguing a lot about the natural uh, disaster definition. Um, of course, our academic life is struggling, so even sharing our personal experience might be an idea, or to share geoscience fun facts, so we are approaching to a, wide, a wider audience and, and the lay public, so we are not approaching to our peers. When choosing the format, of course, there are different styles and different word limits in accordance, so you can go for short posts that are up to 500 words, they are less detailed, they are much more general in their content, and you can put a lot of images, but be aware about the copyright of them. Uh, then you can select long posts, of course, I wouldn't exceed 1500 words, they are much more details and they can offer a more specialized overview about the topic uh, you have been interested to. Uh, on the other side, you can go for interviews. They are quite personal, less scientific, quite easy to read from the uh, reader point of view. And of course, they can take a different time uh, for you to write them because you can be uh, you can really interview the people in an oral form or you can let them reply to your uh, questions in a written form. Um, at least you can write opinion posts, of course, for the nature of these kind of, of formats, they are very subjective and humor and sarcasm are really acceptable. In all the cases, I would advise to give a personal touch to everything because there are a lot of blogs out there and we need to be original. Of course, depending on your aim and motivation, your audience differs because you can relate to a broader community of peers, so only just scientists and scientists related to your field of research. A more lay public, a general public, so you need even to um, be careful about the language you're using, or specific groups, for example, high school students. As I said, the language is essential. So. Uh, of course, if you select English, that is the most common, uh, is the yeah the most common language we can use in the internet. Of course, you are gonna reach a wider audience, but sometimes it's much more comfortable for someone to use the mother tongue. In general, I would um, I would suggest avoiding using the jargon. So try to use alternatives or provide some examples of what you're writing. For example, by creating some boxes in your uh, in your posts. Um, what I would like even to say is like, talk simple, but not simplistic. So people, especially the lay public, need to understand that you are doing something really complex because science is really complex and complicated, but you have to explain it in a simple way. And of course, use an inclusive language that English somehow can really help uh, in using an inclusive language. Of course, we were a team and there are a lot of pros and cons in publishing as a team. Uh, if you can imagine, of course, you can reach support by your peers, you can have feedback and discussion. And regarding the visibility, you can really jump quite fast because you have a lot of posts in a limited time and you are sharing the burden and the, the time investment is very little at the very beginning. Of course, the cons are regarding some conflicts that may originate regarding the style or the content. And of course, you have less freedom to choose. Uh, in our case, of course, well, we need to stick even on EGU rules because we are hosted by them. If you fly solo, 
Of course, you have complete freedom in all your choices, on your topics, on your style. But of course, the time investments is really high and it takes a little bit of time to start and to grow and to advertise uh, yourself in this regard. Some more tips I want to share with you is that readers sometimes are quite tired in reading blogs because there are a lot out there. So you need to be catchy. And of course, the first thing, the first thing that they are reading is the title. So really just provide an explosive and really catchy title of your posts. In the same way, you have to use spaces, bold, italics, and keywords in order to catch their attention, but also because if you use keywords, it's really much important, and it's quite easy to find uh, your post while someone is doing a, a web search on the internet. Again, as I said before, if you're using images, just be aware and pay attention to the copyright, because not everything that you find in your browser uh, search can be reused without permission. And there are some websites that allow you uh, to have some pictures uh, without any, any copyright. Um, if you fly solo, uh, of course, you need a friend or a peer who is reading over your post before publishing. That is a good exercise for you, but also because you have a feedback of someone external from your field. And keep an eye on the analytics. So as we are all researchers, we do like statistics a lot. Uh, of course, they are not essential, but can help you to tailor your content, but also check your performance and your audience. So what we have achieved so far is that by looking at Matomo statistics, uh, we grew up a lot. And not only we, we expanded out from Europe, so uh, we are very glad that we reach India, the Philippines, and Japan a lot. So we are reaching Asian countries as well. And we have also changed our content because we have seen that the 101 series was much more catchy than other type posts because, of course, they are much more reachable in the search net because of keywords. We are using Matomo and not Google Analytics because of some privacy data that are um, released by those websites. So 10 minutes are really short time. So uh, I hope I have gave you a little bit uh, some tips for writing and starting your blog. If you want to know more, there is this fantastic short course called Science Blogging for Beginners available for free on the EGU YouTube channel. So check it out. So if you want to give it a try on our Natural Hazard blog, uh, just write to us as ecs-nh at egu.eu. We will really eager to welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for your presentation. I hope that there will be time at the end, uh, the end to discuss uh, some questions with you too. So now I would like to leave the floor to our second presenter today. It is Van Zelst, uh, is a postdoc at the German uh, Aerospace Center in Berlin, where she studies the evolution of Venus. She worked on subduction and earthquake dynamics at the University of Leeds and at uh, ETH at Zurich. Uh, she's a very active in the EGU community, in particular at the geodynamic division, where she's ed editor in chief of the blog. But um, the reason for which, uh, in particular today, Iris is, is here is because she started a YouTube channel at the beginning of 2021 to shed light on what life uh, is uh, like as a postdoc. And for her Science Sisters interview series on YouTube, she, she re recently won the EG AGU Sharing Science Grant, and she won the 2021 EGU Public Engagement Grant to develop an educational card game about the geological time scale. So we are really happy to have Iris today here with us. And I leave you the floor for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here and inviting me. I'm very excited. Um, I hope you can see this. Um, what this is, is this about? Well, I wanted to give you some hands-on tips on how to start vlogging. Spoiler, the answer is just do it. That's really all there is to it. And um, yeah, I'm going to be giving you very 
specific examples from my experience. It's probably going to be a bit cringy, but you know, it's vlogging. Um, also, when I talk about vlogging, video blogging, um, it's it has this connotation that it is, you know, a person talking into a camera about themselves. I don't necessarily mean that. I also mean um, any kind of video you might want to make, really. So that's what we're talking about today. So vlogging is, in my world at least, kind of associated with YouTube. That's where you upload your videos. So how do you start a YouTube channel? Well, step one is have a basic plan. Doesn't have to be very complicated, but try and answer the following questions for yourself. What is your goal? Who is your target audience? What kind of videos do you want to make? And how often do you want to make a video? And I am now immediately, shamelessly, going into the self-promotion in order to answer these questions myself. Because as mentioned, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, this is kind of the weird stuff that I do. Uh, this is the link. And um, to kind of guide you through this, I will answer these questions for myself. The goal that I have is to entertain people. <laughs> um, you know, I want people to watch it um, and it shouldn't feel like work. It should just be something fun that I put up. Um, but it still is about science, but it shouldn't feel like work. And I want to show what life as a researcher is like because I was missing that. I wanted to see another postdoc struggling in academia and there wasn't one that I could find. So, you know, I became that person. And I wanted to start honest conversations about academia and all the weird things that are here. My target audience, therefore, since I'm making something that I would like to see, is you guys, basically, young academic professionals, PhDs and postdocs, kind of, you know, at the beginning of their academic career. And also, as I'm, uh, you know, educating people on what life as a researcher is like, prospective academic students that are interested in maybe going into science or going to the university, and then to a lesser extent, the general public to show what life is like at university. The kind of videos that I wanted to make are sketches and skits and kind of comedy things on academic life. I wanted to make postdoc vlogs once a month to show what I've been doing as a month as a postdoc, like what do you do in a month? And then Science Sisters, which is an interview series where I um, have a guest on the show and we talk about something uh, that is wrong in academia, basically. And I wanted to make videos once a week. So those are my answers. Okay, so I've told you that, have this basic plan, but how do you actually do it? Um, that's a very simple answer. Just do it. <laughs> And I'm serious, just start and start for the right reasons, because, you know, starting a YouTube channel for the fame or the money is probably not going to get you anywhere because you will not get famous and you will not make money. At least I don't. I lose money very regularly all the time. Um, so the reasons I started doing it because I wanted to learn a new skill. I wanted to learn how to do video editing and how to produce videos and the only thing to learn that is by doing and someone said once to me you know the first 50 videos you will produce are going to be crap so you might as well get them over with as soon as possible so just just do it and along the way you'll get better and i also wanted to have a creative outlet um, i just wanted to do some silly things let go of my creativity so that is why i do it and uh, to show you that just do it really is uh, what I did. This is the thumbnail of my ever first YouTube video that I uploaded uh, when I started to think seriously about this. And um, well, let's just see how it uh, started. It's about me reviewing Scrat's Continental Crack Up, which is an Ice Age uh, comedy skit and seeing if there's any mistakes in it from a scientific point of view. Hello and welcome! I am Iris and I will be your scientist on this flight! Yeah, so <laughs> to me this is very cringy. Choices were made. Um, yeah, it's not my best work. Funnily enough though, it is the second most viewed video on my YouTube channel with over 2000 views. Which is not something I necessarily want, but you know, a beggar's can't be chooses. Um, 
yeah, th there were definite mistakes, but along the way you learn, right? So, you know, you can start at cringy, it's fine. In terms of equipment, the golden rule is don't take all my money. It might be very tempting if you want to start, if you're like, oh, I need a fancy camera, I need a fancy microphone. No, you don't need that. Whatever I filmed here was, you know, uh, filmed with no fancy microphone or whatever. So, uh, and, and it's the video, like one of the videos that's done the best on my channel. So it really doesn't matter. A phone will do in most cases. If you are really eager to invest in something, um, maybe start with a microphone because people's ears are more easily offended than their eyes. So it might seem counterintuitive, but a microphone is the better choice to invest in first. And then, you know, maybe a camera, but really not necessary. Okay, so I've been talking about this, still haven't told you how to make a video. So I'm going to do that now. How to make a video, three steps, pre-production, production, post-production, post -production, and we'll go through them right now. Pre-production, start with the idea, have an idea of what you want to film, what you want to do. Um, and then if that idea involves collaborators, reach out to them. And the golden rule here is fortune favors the bold. Um, I told you I have an interview series and besides friends and colleagues that I wanted to have on that interview series, I of course also wanted someone that I didn't know and I thought was quite famous. So this is Simon Clark. He is a big YouTuber in my eyes with over 350,000 subscribers, which is way more than my 200. <laughs> so um, I just reached out to him on Twitter and he said, yes, of course, I'll join your interview. So golden rule, just ask, fortune favors the bold. And you know, the worst thing that could happen is that you either don't get a reply or someone says, no, thank you. Both cases, absolutely fine. So um, it can be very scary, but put your um, hesitation and shyness aside and just reach out to people. Think about it the other way. If people reached out to you, uh, you know, to talk about something that you're passionate about, of course you would say yes, because you're excited about it. You want to talk about it. So don't feel shy about that. Um, yeah, but we're not going to talk about this particular video in order to illustrate the production process. We're going to talk about this. This is postdoc in the bedroom about what it is like to do a postdoc completely from your bedroom during a pandemic. And it's a song parody. So I, I modify the lyrics of a certain uh, song that I knew. And this is a thumbnail. And um, I didn't have any collaborators for that. But the pre-production process then looks like this. You write the script, you have text, um, you know, that is the script. I have a little Slack channel with myself where I just talk to myself and put all my ideas and all my scripts and things. And this is a part of what the script looks like. So these are the modified lyrics. Um, but you don't only need text, you also need the shots that you want, the angles. So uh, these again are some of my notes, what I wanted to film. I wanted to film one uh, setting of the song, sitting in the bed and convey these kinds of emotions, etc. And then lastly, you need to prepare your costumes and your props so that everything is readily available and the filming um, can be done rather quickly. So here I have combining all the different shots with the different costumes and what I needed to record for each situation. Okay, then production. Okay, you know, you've, you've laid out all your props, costumes, you know what you want to film, you have your script, now you need to do it. So you set up your camera, maybe you set up your microphone, and then in this case, since it was a song, I recorded the audio first and edited that. Um, and afterwards I filmed over it. So this is uh, the awkwardness that I never thought would see the light of day that is recording and editing the audio. I'm a postdoc in my bedroom with my contract almost done. Yes, so, you know, no background music. And then I just have the backing track on loop, later take the best take edit some things together to make it sound a little bit better. And then I have the final audio recording. 
And then once I have that, you need to film the video from your multiple angles, with your multiple costumes, maybe do multiple takes if you screw up. And this is then how I start uh, recording the actual video. Turn this on, hide it. All right, all right. All right. So what you saw me do is I have this um, uh, little remote control to record, start a recording remotely. Here we go. And then I need to hide that because I don't want to have it in shot. And then, um, let's see. I start the music so that I can sing along with it. So that uh, later in post-production, I can sync the song uh, with the actual nicely produced audio um, so that my lips will sync up with the sound and I have the better produced audio. And then you need to do the post-production. You know, you've filmed everything, multiple takes, and then you need to edit. And that arguably takes the longest. So you need to cut all the different takes together, cut out any mistakes. You can make it pretty, you know, boost the colors, uh, polish the sound, add background music, add flying, you know, airplanes apparently, add an end screen, etc. The edit is where you can really make your video. Um, and the way I edit is in iMovie. If you're wondering what kind of software to use, why do I use iMovie? It was free and it was pre-installed on my laptop. And uh, sometimes I'm frustrated that it doesn't do all the things that I wanted to do, but it's free, so I can't really complain about that. And it works for, for most things. And then lastly, you need to have the thumbnail, something that catches the eye of the observer on YouTube. And um, then you're pretty ready to go and you get something like this. I'm a postdoc in my bedroom with my contract almost done. Which is halfway decent. And um, if you uh, look very closely, the things that I pay attention to is that the cuts align with the music on the beat and the accents of music. Yeah. Um, so, just a summary golden rules have a basic plan. Just do it, execute your plan. Don't take all the money, don't need the fanciest of equipment. You can just take your phone and do it. And fortune favors the bold. Just ask around. People will most likely want to collaborate. And then go and make your video pre production, production, post production. And then taking my own advice um, fortune favors the bold. This is again my YouTube channel. Feel free to subscribe and like and share and whatever you need to do these days. That's not something I'm very good at, which is why I'm very much looking forward to the next talk, because I think I will learn a lot from that. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Iris, for your presentation. It was very interesting, but also very, very funny. So I'm really happy for this, uh, for this uh, presentation. So now I think that we are going to, to move to our last uh, guest today, that is Roberto Guardo. Uh, Roberto is a geophysicist and a volcanologist with uh, strong experience in GIS. He attended both bachelor and master at the University of Catania in Italy, where he studied and published about uh, Mount Etna. He also took courses at uh, Halborg University of Copenhagen in Denmark. In 2016, he moved to Argentina for a PhD position in, volcano in volcan volcanology and seismology that he completed in 2020. He defines himself as a multipotentialite with several interests, one of which is science communication. That's uh, the reason for which uh, Roberto is here today with the speech uh, Science communication, a failed plan B to the publish or perish. So I leave you the floor for your presentation, Roberto. Thank you, Silvia. And hi, everyone. Who, thank you for being here. And yes, I'm going to talk about a failed plan B to the publish or perish. Because once I was going to complete my PhD, I said, okay, I understand, I realized that I don't like to write papers. 
and that's for a researcher is a big issue. So I said, I like to talk. So I can move to science communication. Everybody do communication and there are a lot of science communicators. So it not must be that hard. I was wrong, empresarios. So I tried and I failed, or at least uh, I failed considering that a plan B for the publisher of Perch. So it is a plan that I'm pushing on, pushing forward, and I don't know where it will bring me, but I keep going. And we only have less than 10 minutes. And time is a major issue when communicating in social media. No matter what you are communicating, science communication or other kind of communication, the time is one of the most important thing to keep in mind. And you have to adapt your content to the platform you're using. And how to choose the content you are one you want to use? Uh, because how you can see there are a lot of uh, platforms with several billion users and it is hard to choose. And I'm going to show you the most important rule that uh, belongs, that cover uh, the, uh, the platform we are using. So no matter which one you choose, there are three main rules for every platform. The first one is the golden and harder rule is the but. Be always there because every algorithm is a new enemy. And if you say that, no, oh, okay, algorithms, you're here to help, that's a lie. The algorithm is your enemy and we are going to see why. Second rule, the battle for attention. People and time are limited, meaning that there are a lot of content creators and people have to choose which one wants to watch or listen. So you have to be fast when you want to communicate something and you have to keep in mind that there are a lot of people creating content. So uh, you have to fight with our content creator to gain the attention of your audience. And the third one, spell the name to become a shadow. Never, never say the name of another platform uh, while you are sharing content in a platform. If you are in, on Instagram, don't say YouTube or Twitch. You can say Facebook because they are the same, the same. but never say the name of other platform. You are, if you are on YouTube and you say Instagram, Twitch, you can fall in the shadow ban. So people will see less of your content or you will not be uh, shared by the algorithm. You will be hide, banned. And that's are the three main rule. And there are a lot of uh, different stats online, uh, but almost none talks about science communication. So I'm going to talk about what I found out during the last three years on just four platforms that are YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitch. As I see myself, it's like uh, uh, my life. I was born on YouTube. I will going. I grew up on uh, Instagram and Facebook, and I'm going to die on Twitch because of the time and because I really like. Let's start with YouTube. I divided uh, between pros and cons. YouTube is almost but free, meaning that you do not need to be always there, but you must be constant. Because if you do not publish once a week or once of two weeks while you are small, while, while you are, um, you have less than five or 10,000 subscribers, the algorithm hides you if you do not publish. I tried this myself. I didn't publish for almost one year. And this Saturday I published a new video and it reached less than 50% of the views that I was used to reach. Uh, the, the algorithm helps you uh, to reach people with similar interests. 
and the videos are indexed. That means that if you look for some contents on Google, you can find out videos that doesn't work on other platform like Instagram, we will see later. Uh, there is a self-certification while you are update, uploading a video, it means that uh, YouTube algorithm asks you if in your video there are inappropriate language, violence, drug-related content, and other things like that depends on uh, the language you are publishing the video. And that's help you to gain uh, possibility to publish without censorship uh, and also the um, use of ads on your videos. There are three types of contents, short video like real, the normal video and the live uh, stream. And YouTube is the second most used uh, social platform. And as it is said earlier, it is time consuming because you have to record and what before recording, you have to write down what you want to say and um, you have to edit and then upload. And it takes a long, depends on uh, how long is your video. And there is almost no pay when you have, uh, when you are a really small YouTuber, you have to reach a really great number of subscribers to see some money. Um, well, one important thing that you have to remind is that you, you have to check the nationality of your audience. And for uh, I want to say other things about the low pay. When you start to monetize, it's not as you start. You can start monetizing once you reach 4,000 uh, 4, hours of view and 1,000 subscribers. It's not that easy. Let's move to Instagram. That there are four types of contents the posts, the stories, reels, and Instagram TV. Uh, it is easy to create network without a content creator because it just, you can send a message and if they reply, it's done. And it helps you develop a relationship with your audience because they write you and if you want, just reply and you are start connecting with them. There are a lot of calls, in my opinion, about Instagrams. It's not indexed, so you cannot find um, information of your post on Google, you are not indexed. There is a strongest but. Uh, you will always be there. You must be always there because there are a lot of people sharing content that hides you. Uh, the algorithm change continuously. And for example, uh, now you can uh, do live stream of four hours maximum length while uh, last year was only one hour. And there is a heavy competition and there is a lot of bots and scam. That's really a problem. And there is a strong censorship. For example, what I experienced last week is that I upload a satellite volcano image that probably is not that clear because it is a satellite image of a really low quality, but it was considered nudity or sexual activity. So it was shut down. The same censorship happened on Facebook because, you know, the same boss uh, behind them. But Facebook is the first most used social media. You have the sponsored post that is also a con because if you don't have money, you cannot sponsor your post. Uh, your profile can be your page. So if you have 5,000 friends, you can convert them in 5,000 subscribers. And you can manage the posts automatically uh, in the Facebook business app. And you can post directly on Facebook, on Instagram, or on both of them. And the cons is that there are a lot of fake news that are shared by all this age users that create uh, some sort of toxic place. So it's not that fun being on Facebook this time. And as I said, uh, there is a strong censorship. And let's move to the one that I really, really prefer. That prob probably is the hardest to use. That is Twitch. You can be there all the time you want. There is no stop on recording live stream. You can be online live streaming for months. It is crazy. 
uh, you can reach alternative public, mostly young, that uh, find your stream just by chance, not because are indexed. So you can uh, find a new audience uh, that they didn't know uh, they could like your content. You can monetize not easily, but faster because people um, can send uh, uh, money in every kind of form on Twitch. They can do donation or can subscribe and you can receive a part of that money. And it's much faster than YouTube. There is a great engagement uh, with the people in chat because they can... Uh, unlock feature just by writing how on depends on how much they write on your chat they unlock features and they can be the best of your audience so people like to be engaged in that challenge like a video game and it is challenging because it is like a video game uh, where you unlock feature depends on uh, how much time you spend on the audience you reach, how many people are in the chat at the same time, how many people are writing, how much messages they are sending. So it depends on that, you unlock features and you unlock new levels. And depends on new level, you can gain more money. But it is important to remember that if you lose that uh, the streak, that goal you already reached, you downweight. That's tricky. And there is almost no censorship when you are a smaller Twitcher because no one is controlling you. But once you gain view, that can be a problem because the algorithm is not that good to understand when you are joking, when you are uh, talking about history, for example, and when you are talking about, oh, you are doing something that is not uh, on the guideline. And the cons is that if you are unknown, you will not have audience. That means you need a fan, a fan base to start because if you, are, if you have less than five people watching your stream, it is hard to reach others. Uh, it is a lot of time consuming because you learn, you need to learn uh, the setup, you need to learn how to use the streaming software and it is pretty hard. And actually in Twitch, you need good artwork like microphone and a camera and also light setting because people do not like to watch stream that are not uh, interesting and not well for the sight and the listening part. And as I said, you need to be constant or you down with your position. And once say that, uh, uh, th there is a main pro between all the platform that is only one advice I give you, that is be yourself. Because if you are yourself, you can switch from a platform to another one and you don't need to adapt on the platform, but you have to adapt uh, the kind of format you are sharing but not yourself so that's it's my only advice and as i say just do it and thank you for your attention and you can follow me on youtube on twitch or on instagram and if you want you can give me feedback on my english <laughs> and if it is good enough i may start to think to make video also in english and thank you again Thank you, Roberto. For sure, it is better than mine, your English, so you can for sure go for it. Uh, I leave you the floor to Nigar that is going to moderate uh, now the question and answer session. Please, Nigar. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank all of the speakers for their valuable advice and helpful tips on how to communicate science using digital words, really. Um, we actually have a couple of questions from our audience. Uh, I actually uh, select um, one question at this time to each of our speakers. So um, one of them is for Julia. So um, someone asks, um, 
how can we uh, gradually introduce basic technical terms to social media if there is no room for explanations? So um, if, if we can start with you, then you know, I can perhaps get other people on the panels uh, as well to give their um, view on this. Yeah, thank you very much. I will be very short. Basically, what we do is that we sometimes offer some boxes in which we explain the basic concepts. Uh, second, we can recall to other material that is external to our material itself. And we also uh, took advantage of these, let's say, limitation. And this is the reason why we performed a one on one series in which we explain exactly basic terminologies and we help our readers uh, to or readers or audience to understand them. And if you are doing some videos, I guess that Iris is going to be the best person uh, to answer this. But I guess that you can even recall to your previous videos so you can advertise yourself more. Yes, that makes sense. Thanks so much. So um, the next question is for Iris. Um, they mentioned, uh, could you talk about how much time commitment each production requ uh, requires, require, is required for each production? Uh, yes, uh, quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> I was very optimistic in the beginning. Oh, once a week, great. Uh, it is not great. Um, yeah, it, it takes about, uh, it, it depends very heavily on the type of video that I make. Usually I kind of write the scripts, I don't know, like during the day or have an idea. Uh, so that isn't really the most time consuming. Uh, the filming is usually rather short. It can be like maximum half an hour, um, unless there is um, an interview that I do when it's about uh, one or two hours. But also relatively short, and then the edit. Uh, that just takes a long time. I, I have been getting quicker, like you, when you learn over time, it will go faster. In the beginning, it took me hours, days to do really short videos. Now it goes a lot faster and it can take me like a couple of hours to do like a 10 minute video. Um, and it depends on what kind of video it was. So if it's very heavily scripted, so if I have every sentence that I want in there in a comedy sketch, it's very easy because I have multiple takes. I pick the best take and then <laughs> that is that part of the video done. And then I kind of have to uh, kind of cut that all together, but that's fine. If it's something where I'm more kind of talking, it's harder because I get off track very easily <laughs> in order to make it concise yeah. and still make sense. Um, it so takes longer. Apparently editing is the uh, most time consuming part of the whole production, perhaps, yeah. And it is not some, but you know, I think the best thing about it is that you don't have to do it in one go. Like you can still separate it in different, you know, in your schedule, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but thanks. And, if I uh, may add yeah. something about that, uh, it is also hard in the post-production, the editing part, because you have to sum up uh, image content that helps to explain what you are saying. Yeah. And it is hard to do it all in once, because if you let pass days, your style change. So once your style changes, you do the edit in a different style, in a different form, and there is no coherence on the video. And if the video is long, it is hard. So it's, uh, it is necessary to become, um, to, to, to increase your ability in uh, editing the video. So you will do that in less time. But as Iris said, eight minutes of video, I mount that in, four or five hours, for example. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, I hope, yeah, I hope the answer, I mean, the answer is, you know, it's quite complete. So I hope, you know, you got an idea of how, how much time it is really required. And the, the, this question is, you know, so, uh, sort of to everyone, uh, but I start with uh, Roberto perhaps. So, uh, 
the question is how do you deal with the comments of the audience uh, specifically when it would be in opposition of your posts and contents do they affect uh, your um, upcoming posts uh yes they affect the upcoming posts some in a bad way others in a good way depends on the type of comments because if it is a uh, good critics that they say for example oh you forget to say that or for example it happens on my youtube video that i talked about volcano dormant volcano active volcanoes and I made an example of an active volcanoes put in the category of dormant volcano. And in my comments, someone said, but you say that it is in this point time. So this volcano is an active one. True, you are right. Then my manage is that um, say sorry, learn from my mistakes and uh, grow from that mistakes and make uh, greater videos. On the other hand, while there are some haters that just write bad stuff on you because they are haters, uh, I just ignore them. And it's really hard to ignore and be peaceful <laughs> with yourself, but it's the only way. Do not engage with haters because they drain your energy and your time. Mm -hmm. Not, But they are good for... <laughs> Um, for the dissing and they are good for let grow your channel but they drain your energy so do not engage with others and ignore them and go ahead thanks so much roberto and iris do you want to add something no yeah i agree if it's if it's a weird comment like it's very clear which ones are sincere and helpful and actually watch the video and which ones are just hate comments or spam or whatever just ignore it it's it's not nice but you'll get over it <laughs> yeah hope you know we sort of don't expect getting uh, extreme bad extremely bad comments for you know um especially uh, communications in science because well, it has a sort of a specific community, you know, the audience is sort of selected in, in many ways, but, uh, but still, yeah, it's not something that avoids um, any bad comments. And then uh, the last question at, the, at this time is uh, for Julia again. So uh, someone asks, how should scientists really address a broader audience? How to reach people who are not already looking for you so Sorry, I do. yeah um, this is not a really easy question to answer basically you have to give it a try and trying to advertise it a lot and have a good team that is going to help you because as i said if you fly solo you have a limited number of people to be reached and of course, we have a good platform in which we are hosted, that is the EGU. So we jumped already from a good start and we are sharing our content with a well-defined community. So I don't know exactly how it works when you have to start from ground zero, basically. Uh, maybe Roberto and, and Iris would, would answer it better because we, we, we got very a lucky situation from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but still, as you mentioned, I think Natural Hazardous is a very good platform anyway for anyone who wants to start with, um, you know, just to show what they are doing in this uh, context. Um, and yeah. And how about uh, Roberto or Iris? Do you want to add any uh, comments to answer this question? I mean, I can say that it's very hard and I don't really have a solution because I'm not particularly good at this. <laughs> this is the stage where I fail. But um, uh, I, I don't know, because, yeah, ideally you want someone to endorse you like that, that each you is kind of by whatever retweeting or something like that. Uh, but it's difficult to to persuade them to do that if it's not already affiliated with each you. Um, what I have found but I'm not really a Reddit user. Mm. Um, so sometimes I post videos there and then because you have very specific communities, um, lots of people watch it 
um, and there is increased engagement. This is why some of the videos have like uh, a, a few more views, but um, it's a tricky platform that I don't really know how to navigate because you have to uh, be part of the community and I don't have time to be on Reddit all the time. <laughs> So I just kind of pop in and say, hi, this is my video and then pop out. And if you do that too often, they don't like that. Mm. So, but as, as you said before, uh, just jumping into your answer, if you interview someone that is famous, you might, might have the chance to enlarge your community, isn't it? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Th that's another way, the, the collabs. Mm. <laughs> that can help, yeah. yeah uh, although my... it hasn't helped in my case, but yeah. My experience is that I, I, I tried both methods and the one when you try to be endorsed, even if you have a, a good uh, goals, like I want to share my contents to as much as persons as possible because there are a lot of fake news. I want to explain in the best way the earthquakes so people will not scared about them. It doesn't work. So you have to first uh, share other people's contents. Yes. You share them and people will be happy to share you as well. And then you, second, you can try to use the best hashtag you can find on Google Trends. And third, use the trend. Thank you so much, Roberto. It was very good advice. I uh, thank everyone for uh, taking their time uh, for answering this question and questions. And uh, now I hand uh, it over to Silvia to conclude. Yes, very briefly, I would like to share something with you. I hope that I have been able to learn from my previous mistakes as suggested by Roberto before. So I try to share my screen now in the proper way. I'm doing my best, uh, sorry. No, it's not working, but if I, Swap displays, is it working now, right? Great, I learned from my mistakes. So just to conclude, I would like to say thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is just to let you know that uh, this is not uh, the last event we are organizing as, a, as an early career scientist uh, NH uh, group. These are the upcoming events we have already scheduled. In March, uh, we will focus on uh, uh, some tips to be ready to present at EGU General Assembly. Then in June, uh, we will move to uh, the funding opportunities to boost the scientific research. And then uh, in, uh, in autumn, we will talk about the uh, challenges to be women in natural hazards and academia. If you want to know, um, for example, the, the date uh, when we'll be uh, fixed when, of these events, or in general, uh, stay tuned about uh, all our activities. These are our, uh, our social media uh, channels that we're using. So we have Twitter, Facebook. You can subscribe to our mailing list. And I also would like to, to, to underline that uh, the, the, say the keynotes of this uh, interesting webinar will be to say, uh, reorganize a little bit, rearrange in a blog post that we will be, pu will be published in the next weeks uh, on our uh, NH division blog. So it, this is the, the link uh, the, to the web page of the blog where you will find uh, in the next weeks also uh, some contents related to this uh, webinar. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the, Iris, Roberto and Julia for, for their uh, speech. Uh, speech and also to Nigar for the support and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.